we just wanted to start off this panel. We're just going to spend a few minutes just giving you an update behind the panel on the Writers Guild Foundation about the, the business of creating panels. And we'll kind of go through that just quickly for a couple of minutes. Um, and then we'll do the introduction of the panelists and, and dive right in. But first of all, we want to say, first of all, thank you. And thank you for joining this panel. We're very excited that you're here. You know, it's something that we are very passionate about here on the panelists and moderator side, as well as with the Writers Guild Foundation um, on this topic. And there's been a lot of discussion about it. Um, you know, you probably already know what the panel is going to be about. We'll explain a little bit more later. But if, Jen, we go to the next slide, we wanted to, first of all, thank our our sponsors with the Writers Guild Foundation, and um, they definitely have been a wonderful partner with these with these panel series that we've done with Business of Creating, and wanted to kind of pass it on to Dustin for just a quick overview of Writers Guild Foundation here before we move on. Sure, absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Dustin. I'm the Events and Operations Coordinator with the Writers Guild Foundation. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. That's a nonprofit arm of the Writers Guild of America West here in Los Angeles. Um, we are a resource for uh, aspiring, emerging, and current uh, screenwriters. Um, when we're not closed down, we've been closed down because of this pandemic since March, our in person uh, library and facilities. Um, we offer resources for people on site uh, through our library, which has over 40,000. Um, scripts for people to uh, sit in their library and read of produced movies and TV shows. Um, so it's a great resource for reading your favorite scripts um, and a great uh, area to sit down and get some writing done uh, that's not your standard coffee shop. Um, we also host events throughout the week. Right now we're doing virtual events uh, through Zoom webinar and you can find out more information about our events our library, as well as our community engagement programs, including the Veterans Writing Project at wgfoundation.org, which I believe is where you went to sign up for this event as well. So just hop back to wgfoundation.org and click through to explore all the resources uh, that we offer. You don't have to be a WGA member to attend our events on the foundation side. So just an important uh, note. And with that, I'm just gonna turn it right back over to Michael. Thank you, Dustin. And just to underscore what, what Dustin said, when this pandemic ends and we're out, allowed to go back out and about and the uh, Writers Guild Foundations open up, please take the time to check out their building and their library. It's just absolutely beautiful and an incredible resource. Um, just to give you a little background um, about the business of creating, um, this is um, something that Jennifer and I co-founded three years ago, actually, right? It's, Jen, I always mix up the year, but I wanna say it's almost three years. I wanna say, right? I know she's laughing at me because I always forget this. Um, yeah, and, yeah, almost three. It's almost three? Okay, we're getting there. We'll, we'll, we'll have to have a little like cake celebration when we, when we get there. And it really is just, it really started as just kind of like as, you know, passion and helping our creative industry. And, um, and it's something that for me, is, I feel very, very blessed because I get to work with a dear friend, Jennifer, and who also just happens to be a very um, talented writer and producer with her production and writing company, um, Beautiful Day Productions. So um, this is something that you know, we do on the side. This is our, our side passion. Um, and we've put together quite a few of these. And again, it's really to help this our, our, everyone here who's on this call, <laughs> this creative community, particularly in these times of change, you know, how do we help each other out? How do we make each other stronger? And what we definitely encourage you to do, and you'll see on the bottom portion of it, there's a chat function um, and a Q&A function. And we encourage you to actually, you know, talk with one another, you know, because what we find out when we have these in real time, people introduce each other and they get really great context and it's a good networking opportunity. So we encourage you to say hello to each other in the chat room. If you can, you know, say your name, where you're from. We're actually getting people from around the world. I think, who do we, Jen, we always do a shout out to certain countries. Yeah, hey, we got our friend Robin out in uh, South Africa, which is always, you know, yay, welcome everybody. So yes, please, uh, everybody, I see we got 261, 62, 63 participants. Uh, we're growing exponentially even as we speak. So please uh, put it in the chat where you're coming from, where you're logging in from. So that way, you know, we can feel even more delighted that not only are we getting locals here in LA, but we're getting people from all over the world. We, we would really appreciate you putting that in. Thank you. Yes. So, okay, can I flip the slide? Yep. I'm so doing it. Up. I'm taking, you know, executive decisions. Oh, there Check you out are. Your Perfect. 
Yeah. As, as we said, we've done, you know, this will be panel 18, but it goes, we, we pick topics, you know, that usually it's basically everyone here who's on the calls, you know, saying we want to know more about this. You know, we want to know about how to do robomatics and sales reels. We want to know more about financing projects and developing or, or creating publicity campaigns or how to use unit photography or film festivals. So it really is a really interesting, diverse um, uh, topics that we talk about. You know, and this is the first time we're doing short form content. Mm -hmm. So the next part, if we go into that, is this is just what the topic is about. And I think what we can do now, Jen, is um, do it to the introductions. Fantastic. Yes, thank you, everybody. I'm doing them quickly today because I appreciate how busy everybody is. And thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, first up on our slide here, it's Catherine Hallaby. Woo -hoo! <laughs> you can imagine all the clapping. Ping, Catherine. Uh, Catherine <laughs> is the lead entertainment partnerships for TikTok, working with publishers, entertainment brands, and others to grow audiences both on TikTok and to translate their story form to short form vertical. She loves great content in all formats, everybody. Documentaries, features, scripted and reality television, podcasts, and of course, TikToks. Everybody, let's welcome Catherine Hallaby. <laughs> And right next to her here, we have Jeffrey Weisenbaum. Everybody yes. clapping for Jeffrey, yay. <laughs> Jeffrey is the head of content at Instagram. He oversees Instagram's editorial strategy as well as, well as other brand owned social channels. Prior to joining Instagram, he's got quite the fun history. He was senior director of development and social studios at Group Nine Media, led the originals and live programming team for E! News, and was then also a writer and reporter for Ryan Seacrest Productions. Everybody, let's give a round of applause for Jeffrey Weisenbaum. <laughs> All right, we've got the content side. Now we're looking at some famous marketers. It's Dan Heal coming to us from Way to Blue. Yay, Dan! All right, Dan, he is the CEO of global entertainment marketing agency Way to Blue. His clients include Amazon Prime, Warner Brothers, Paramount Pictures, BET, Skydance Media, TikTok, Instagram, and others. Uh, Way to Blue delivers everything from pre-production support with strategy and creative ideas through to content production and paid media campaigns for TV, radio, and digital platforms. Uh, they work both marketing departments with both marketing departments and producers to create strategy and campaigns for film and TV series. And we're gonna be learning more about this today. Way to Blue recently worked with Leica Studios to launch their brand account on TikTok and helping them to grow over 2 million followers in just a couple of months. Okay, we need to learn about these strategies. Everybody welcome Dan Heal. And finally, my partner in crime, it's Michael Fisk. Hey, Michael. Michael is my co-founder with the Pan Series, as you know. Uh, he is a senior marketing executive in the entertainment industry. Check it out. He's spearheaded over 400 marketing campaigns for studios like Sony, Lionsgate, NBC Universal, Warner Brothers, and currently for MGM. Uh, Michael also runs Intermark Strategy and Consulting, the international consulting practice focusing on helping all of us, filmmakers, content creators, producers, directors, and distributors with long-term marketing and strategy. His passion, as you can probably tell, is making your passion project succeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, his favorite marketing campaigns, some of them are the James Bond franchise, uh, La La Land, and most recently he worked with on Peanut Butter Falcon. Everybody, let's welcome Michael and our amazing panel. Okay, y'all, we're jumping forward here. All right, what, what are we looking at today? What are we covering? Yeah, so, Michael. yeah, so what we wanted to do first, you know, there's a lot we're going to talk about, and people are going to have a ton of questions, which is great, but I also want to just kind of say this panel is about Really, it's about, you know, how do you create, you know, scripted and unscripted content? You know, what is short form content? I mean, this is not about what we're seeing in the media. It's not about the geopolitics of platforms. It's not about financial issues. You know, it's not about how to be an influencer, even though influencers, you know, create a lot of content. But we just wanted to kind of put that out there saying this is to help you. What can you do practically to help you create content, you know, short form content? And what is that? So that's what we're kind of sticking with. Um, for the next one, the reason we wanted to bring this up, oh, going back one, oh, 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 is 
I mean, you're seeing a ton of stuff in the news. I mean, particularly, I mean, short form content has been around for a bit, but in general, you're seeing everything of like everyone talking about the Gen Z, you know, um, ad we even talking about this like, just a couple of days ago, you know, it's like, where are audiences going? So this is important for everyone who's attending it is like, okay, who is your audience? Why is it important? Who do you want to go after? You know, and you're kind of seeing how the evolution of the short form type content platforms have evolved, but also you're seeing particularly, I mean, it's always been around I and mean, Quibi's gotten a lot of news lately, you know, but also if you are really into awards, you know, they've been actually at the Emmys. Um, they have actually gotten 10 nominations, you know, in this, this year's Emmys, you know, and this again, that's short form content. I think the Emmys only created the short form content category for drama um, in 2016, so only four years ago. So you see this explosion of it. It doesn't mean it didn't exist before, and we'll kind of give an overview on it. But if we go to the next slide, we wanted to kind of define, and so we'll open it up to, I guess, more of the panelists, you know, if Catherine and Jeffrey and Dan, you know, if you want to take the, you know, take the first stab at defining short form versus long form, because we want to make sure that everyone has the basics of like, what are we talking about here as we kind of get into the further questions. Who wants to take it first? <laughs> Moment of silence. <laughs> Everybody forgot what we're talking about. Well, so short form, short form versus long form. Tell me more. I know a lot of us write long form. Help us out here. Well, on TikTok, short form is one minute or less. Um, so that's that's maybe ultra short form. But um, I, you know, I, I don't have a POV of like where the the cutoff is between what counts as long form and what doesn't. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say that the TikTok's probably ultra short form. Ultra. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, you know, just to the point, it's like, I think very often traditionally people are thinking of long form as the 30 minutes, one hour, you know, that's very traditional, you know, and short form is kind of like, I think what we're talking about here in the examples you'll see is it goes down to like, as Catherine's saying, one minute, you know, or, you know, it can kind of go into that 12 minutes, you know, there's that five, eight, 12 minute, but I think in general, we're saying short form, it's, you know, seconds to, you know, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, around there. I guess it's kind of bite-sized, um, easier to consume content that's um, designed maybe just a bit more for being on the go. It requires sort of less commitment in terms of people's time. So it's uh, it's content that you can probably access very quickly and easily on multiple different platforms to to get really kind of a you know a, a quick sense of what's going on, whether it be with news or entertainment or your favourite influencers or who you're following. But um, yeah, it's it, to, to us, it's always about less commitment. It's not about sitting down for 30 minutes or 60 minutes and watching a show. It's about capturing the latest update from either a news source or an influence that you're following um, quickly and easily. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, another way we, we talk about it, at least in my sort of uh, agency days pre uh, TikTok is, you know, snackable mm. versus bite size content. So a, mm. a snack could be eight to 10 minutes and a bite would be, you know, a minute or less. Mm. As and opposed it, to a meal that would really be the short form I'm or long form. <laughs> I know it's like, I'm getting hungry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so many metaphors. Uh, but I know, Catherine, do you mind just talking about the UGC versus PGC, you know, because that was something else that's coming up, you know, regarding just kind of like the short form content and the things we have to think about. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's like the the, the sort of industry tech terminology of, of UGC, um, user generated content versus PGC, which we would classify as publisher or maybe professionally generated content. I think the distinction there is less meaningful by the year, if not maybe by the month. Um, I think, you know, the, the TikTok ecosystem is majority UGC by a lot. Um, but what is UGC, I think, is also def expanding in definition. Um, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, maybe the advent of YouTube, you might think of UGC as being like, you know, turning on your webcam and filming yourself like vlogging about your day from your bedroom. And that was the um, maybe uh, origination of, of what we understand as UGC. And then of course there's the Vine era and that sort of serendipitous moment or the viral video um, that uh, I, I think, you know, the, the lines blur even further. And I think what I observe anyway from my perch at TikTok, working primarily with publishers who are trying to figure out how to behave like creators, like how to 
make content and tell stories that fits in in a world where UGC is is the norm, where you know everyone's a creator. I mean, we, I'm sure you've you've all heard the 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 sort of ways that. Um, those of us at platforms often, I think, speak very similarly about, you know, what the opportunity is for a content creator and how that opportunity has been democratized um, by, you know, the existence of a lot of these platforms that are kind of um, replacing some of the gateholders, certainly not all of them. And there are a lot of, of they're just kind of different gatekeepers now in a lot of ways. Um, but I think certainly if what you're looking for is um, a way to test ideas with an audience, um, you know, thinking about professionalizing and, and blurring that line between user and publisher um, for the kinds of content that you can just put out there on your own um, is increasingly the norm. Well, I think one of the other distinctions as well, um, to pick up on some of the points that Catherine is making there, is that um, short form content has been very much led by the audience or, you know, it's been, it's been led by consumers. We're now sort of an environment where with the, you know, the launch of, of Quibi and certainly that TikTok is starting to invest in, in more of this kind of premium or professional content, which is great, but the, the pr sort of production values, the, the way in which the content is shot, the time lengths, and even down to the kind of vertical format, that's been very much led by audiences. They, they, they were there first, you know, in terms of UGC, obviously we've had kind of 10, 10 plus years now of people creating content for, for YouTube and more recently for, for Instagram and, and, and TikTok. But this is a very audience-led space and it's very interesting to see uh, whether, they, whether it's sort of professional publishers or premium content makers actually following trends that have been set by the audience in the first place. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's honestly a, a, an amazing point uh, around showing up where the consumers are in an authentic way. Like, you know, Instagram, we have multiple different surfaces for different lengths of content, different types of content. So feed has photo and video up to 60 seconds. Stories are 15 second little clips that you can add art and different kind of creative uh, uh, tools to it. We have IGTV for videos up to about an hour. Um, we've got live, you can go for a long time, broadcast for a long time or a short amount of time. And then we have a new format um, coming out called Reels which is a short uh, entertaining, entertaining uh, video content. And so it's, you can show up in those surfaces in a unique way to, sh to sort of be among the other uh, UGC uh, created content too. So it's really about showing up in those surfaces in an authentic way. Yeah. Great thing about Instagram and TikTok as well is the, this, the plethora of different tools that are available within, within channels to create very unique stories um, for, for, for those that are making them, whether it's coming from users or, or more professional publishers. But you know, TikTok is incredible. The amount of things that you can do within the tools that are given to you, it just creates this incredible canvas of creativity. So, and again, we're, we're seeing, I think, the audience is really leading that space and, and professional publishers are following. Yeah, and we definitely are going to um, dive more into it, to your point, Dan, more into, you know, what TikTok and Instagram and other platforms exist. But I think um, before we get off that slide, just this last one, Jen, is just so everyone's aware, too, is if you look at it, you know, if you go back one, these five examples on the bottom, whoop, whoop, one more, um, you know, like short form, I mean, you you see from the, whoop, one more, back, <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> is, you know, you'll see, you know, these are just to give a, a wide example. I mean, short form users are seeing, it's, it is a really like a wide diverse type of field. You know, you have people already in 2007 through 2010 with Adult Swim, you know, creating Tim and Eric Awesome Show, right? For, they did 12 minutes each. You had like YouTube obviously doing her story with nine minutes each. In 2019, you started seeing a lot more uptick, even Netflix, they were used to also known for doing these longer form, but then they realized, hey, these short, bite ones, 10 minutes long, 12 minutes long were important as you see with special and state of the union. And then most recently with a lot of, um, a lot of fanfare, you've seen Quibi, you know, with that entire platform, that's all it is short, you know, here you see most dangerous game, you know, five to nine minutes each, you know, they just kind of, it, it depends on depending what they want to create, but it's, you see the different platforms, the different services, you know, and the different type of lengths there. Um, I think we go to the next one. And Dan, if you don't mind just giving it up. Just oh, kind of like a okay, you know, this is there. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, I'll just be super, super quick here, but just to say we, we tend to see um, short form content falling into, I guess, one of these three buckets, but there's so much merging between them that, that it's kind of somewhat difficult really to delineate. But you've got you've got influencers, you know, some of these people have been around for an incredibly long time. Um, you know, you've got people on the um, uh, on the TikTok platform who have millions and millions of followers and they're creating a lot of their own content, but they're becoming 
brands they're creating franchises they're almost following the same kind of um route that, that marvel and other big franchises are following in in terms of their um their ability to create multiple different types of content they start often on one platform but then they appear on multiple other platforms so you have tiktok influencers that are now growing their presence on youtube and, and so on and twitch and so on and so forth then this group in the middle which um i guess really you can divide into whether it's free for the consumer or there's a, a subscription involved but you've got these kind of premium production studios which we've all mentioned before, you know, with people kind of now moving, moving into the space. And then the third area, and obviously as a marketing agency, the area that's um, probably most um, interesting for us right now is, uh, is this kind of branded content space where, you, where you've got brands like um, Chipotle, you've got brands like uh, Leica, who, who represents um, Nike, who, who are all creating branded content, but um, in incredibly different ways. And I've got a case study a little bit later on to, to talk about Leica. So, but as an agency, we kind of tend to see things in these three different buckets with regards to short form and its, and its growth. And I think the next slide, the oh, next sorry, slide Michael. Yeah. Just jump in yeah, for all the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For all the attendees, think about it. Like when you're creating content, I mean, there's, there, it's such a broad spectrum. You know, you can create them for brands like Nike. You can create content for the specific studios. You can create it for specific people like influencers. So there's, there's all these really incredible opportunities to create content. So just, you know, if, if you're thinking like it's, content's only this, it's actually, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And this slide really was, um, I mean, it, it's a bit of a, kind of a social audit, so you can kind of see what the what the current stats are for some of the major platforms out there. But certainly the, the, the strip in the middle is incredibly interesting. Obviously, TikTok has grown so phenomenally over the last few years. I, I remember standing on a, on a platform um, at, a, at a studio marketing conference in Hong Kong about three years ago, um, trying to persuade some studio marketeers that they should be thinking about experimenting with with TikTok. And, uh, and at the time, I think it was probably around the 150 million or 200 million mark. And obviously it's grown grown so significantly now and, uh, and just has become an incredibly important platform in terms of the media mix. And it really is kind of right up there with, with Facebook, YouTube and Instagram when it comes to consideration for both organic and paid media content. Um, Snap is, is, is very interesting. I mean, Snap has had an interesting kind of checkered, checkered history. They've, they recently commissioned some, uh, some research, which I, I think I saw Michael on an, an earlier slide. There was, a, there was an image of it, but um, they specifically wanted to look into um, millennials and Gen Z and, and how they were consuming content and, and how important mobile is for, for this generation. Obviously, it's incredibly important. Uh, there's like 100% growth year on year with with regard to those, those audiences in terms of their consumption of video content they're watching upwards of four four hours a day i believe so you know going back to the previous slide and looking at those three different buckets of types of content um the audiences that we're talking about don't necessarily dis distinguish and delineate in the same way that we do it's just about content so whether it's premium or whether it's created by an influencer or created by a brand these guys are watching up to four hours a day so it really is an incredibly important growth area and the key thing too is if you look at that top, look at it. I mean, it's there's that B, billions, 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 billions yeah. on some of these platforms, which is, you know, when you think very often people think, oh, I'm going to create it for this one show and this one broadcaster, you know, but there's such like a huge opportunity there for the world, you know, for you to actually reach your content out to the world on these platforms, which is why we wanted to highlight this. One point of clarity, just since I'm on the call, I'll just mention TikTok is not in China. Um, the the similar to Facebook, although our parent company is based in China, the the TikTok app is actually not in China, so you will not reach a Chinese audience on TikTok. Yet, yet. Well, well, there's actually a totally separate product called Douyin that's in, that's very similar to TikTok, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Rebranded. Um, the next couple of slides, uh, these are just a couple of really interesting kind of case studies. Th these may be programs, shows that you're kind of already aware of, but I guess the point being that what, what perhaps starts out is in, in both of these cases as uh, web series that were, were, on, were on YouTube um, being, kind of, being kind of picked up. If you go back to the previous slide, Jen, just really quickly, I, wanted, I just wanted to call out um, some good news. Um, I, hopefully so most people on the call have heard of this show. It was created by John John Krasinski. I think it launched in um, March or April of this year. Um, so d done entirely um, at home during this um, the pandemic period. And, and ultimately, um, the show was there to do what it says on the tin, which is to deliver good news um, in an environment where we're otherwise being bombarded with terrible bad news every day. Um, but it's been picked up by um, uh, Viacom and is, is going to be uh, is going to be shown, I believe, on Comedy Central. You've got um, Hot Ones there, which again started out as a web series um, and moved on to True TV. 
and then going to the next slide, kind of three other examples as well. I kind of wanted to make the point that uh, sort of Netflix, Hulu, Amazon uh, certainly haven't made a name for themselves in the space of, in the space of short form content. Um, HBO have been quite pick, quick to pick shows up actually. So High Maintenance and Secure, two very good examples of shows that started out one one on Vimeo, the other on HBO now and then moved, moved on to the, the kind of main channel of HBO. But um, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, funny show, um, does again what it says on the tin, but um, I, I believe in its ninth or 10th series was, was picked up by Netflix. And I think what we're gonna start to see with Netflix and with Hulu and with Amazon is that they will start to invest a lot more in this space as, as it grows. And you see the stats that we mentioned before about um, millennials and Gen Z um, consuming up to four hours a day of, of, of short form content, whether it's coming from influencers or premium places, it means that uh, some, some of the more established longer form content uh, platforms are going to start to invest in this space. I love all these examples, you guys. I, again, I'm looking at our, I, I'm the timekeeper today, which is, you know, my least favorite job because I just want to sit and listen to everybody all day. But okay, we're getting into some practicalities. So what's unique about it? What's different about it? How can we make it all happen? We're sitting at home. We want a worthwhile homework project to do. Everybody, tell me more. Yeah, well, I would say short form on Instagram uh, is really about just grabbing people's attention really, really quickly, right? If you're thinking of if you're scrolling through or in, on any of the different services of Instagram, you're watching content, it should be, it's such an overused phrase like the tech, but like th thumb stopping, you need to grab people's attention in the first three seconds um, or they will continue on going because there's something great and wonderful uh, right behind it or next to it. Um, and so just grab people's attention early on. Um, a lot of that we, we talked sort of, uh, Michael and I uh, chatted earlier around uh, uh, movie trailers do a really good job at this, that sometimes you wanna tell a narrative or an, uh, a story arc over a period of time but you have three seconds to grab people's attention. So it's sometimes annoying to have to like give away the most exciting things, but you got to hook people's attention to get them to watch the, the rest of it and then see that story play out, hopefully after uh, you've gotten your attention. Um, and then really it's about being authentic on whatever surface you're speaking to. So um, if, it, if again, if it's feed, um, it's up to 60 seconds, it's stories, having a cohesive story over multiple clips, having it all kind of um, uh, connect. And if that short form content, if broken up on those different surfaces can be interactive, that's even better because you have um, the ability to speak to, you know, billions of people at a time and be able to get them to interact with your content. So if you're able to interact with them, uh, back with them, that can also help actually inform uh, future content that you, that you produce, hopefully on a much more faster timetable than uh, a longer form content. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. So you guys, I'm checking my slides as well. Um, I like the point that, okay, we don't need to worry about the, oh, no, it's not a full, you know, 104 page script. We're still doing a lot of the same content creation, only it's just in that much shorter format. Um, so uh, the other question we really wanted to answer on this slide is, so how is the short form content different? when you're the creator versus the advertiser versus the audience, which, you know, which angle you're coming from, what's, what differences that we need to be aware of? I think it's about creating stories for the canvas. So, uh, I mean, uh, uh, most dangerous game on Quibi is a really good example of, you know, uh, is is that a feature film that's broken up into ten parts, or is that actually just sort of ten individual parts? One of the things that I think that show does incredibly well is that it creates um, a full story arc in each of its sort of six, seven, eight minute episodes. So, you you, you enter that show. Um, there's immediately some some sort of form of uh, dilemma or jeopardy in the situation that. Uh, that the main character is being faced with and it resolves within the context of, of each individual episode and I, I think the writers have done a very clever job of, of bringing you in very very quickly uh, delivering a plot point resolving that plot point and then being ready to move on to the next so I think it's just it's, it's storytelling but in a condensed format and to Jeffrey's point as well I think there are some great examples from a UGC perspective of people that tell really good stories on Instagram um, they use all of the features and functionality that can contain within Instagram they create stories that have a beginning and middle and an end. I, I think there's, you know, classic writing techniques just need to be applied to this kind of short form space, um, I, I believe. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and I actually tell partners the same thing about um, TikToks even, which might sound crazy if you're talking about a 15 or 20 second video, but the building blocks of great storytelling still apply. 
do you have a protagonist? Is there a conflict that I'm interested in? And is that, does that grab me in the first two or three seconds? Is there, you know, a building action, a rising action? Is there a resolution? I mean, the best TikToks, um, I think, I mean, there's so many different categories of what I would think of as the best TikToks, but mm. I think frequently, especially with TikToks that are very set, like, you know, that are set to music, where there's no dialogue, or the only audio is music, they're essentially silent films. Um, and, and silent films are the same as, you know, the big blockbusters of today, fundamentally. There has to be some kind of situation that you care about that has some kind of satisfying resolution by the end. Mm -hmm. um, and that is just as true on TikTok, even though we're talking super short. Mm -hmm. Especially having that time frame like right in front of you. I know it's 15 seconds. I know it's 60 seconds, 90 seconds, whatever. It's like there needs to be a payoff. Like if I'm sitting here willing to watch that whole thing, which seems like forever on whatever platform you're like, it's like, what's the payoff? What, what, what am I getting out of this when I, when I watch this thing? Exactly. And it's, the, it's just the creative constraint that you have on a platform, whether you're talking about a TikTok or like an Instagram story. It's just a different kind of creative constraint that I think has... Um, that takes obviously distinct skills and the people who are really great at it, um, you know, get, uh, get a lot of attention for it. Mm. So to summarize that up, then it sounds like the storytelling is the same. The elements are the same. You're going to have your teaser, your act one, act two, act three, et cetera, et cetera, then you want, et cetera. Uh, but it's just in a very much condensed format time frame. Um, which actually uh, slides right over into our next slide, uh, which is, well, can I convert my my 30 minute TV pilot into a short form? Or can I convert whatever I've already written as the full long form content? Can I shunt that down into, you know, multiple mini episodes? And what do I need to be focusing on, changing, adjusting, et cetera, to make this, you know, original stuff into, new versions for shorter form platforms? Mm. It's a good question. And I, I think fundamentally the answer is yes, these stories can be adapted to different lengths and different constraints and different canvases. Um, but it's not that easy and it's certainly not a, it's not a, it, I would say it's rarely, at least when it comes to TikTok, a matter of just like, which scenes do I lift and how do I chop them into, you know, or, or which subsection do I take and just like click play and that's the runtime and I, I just snip mm. 45 seconds instead of two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and, and at least when it comes to what works on TikTok, you know, it can't feel like an ad. It's got, you know, the algorithm is essentially treating every piece of organic content the same. So mm -hmm. is it watchable? Is it loopable? Does it hold my attention from the first second? Does it pay off my attention by the end? Um, you know, all of that, I, I think, is very strongly re related to, you know, what we know, especially about sort of Gen Z and younger audiences today, which is just a, a short attention span and a really high premium on, you better grab my attention, you better earn it. There, it better be very clear what kind of entertainment you're offering me by asking for my attention on this piece of content. Um, and, and you better get that, like, if I, if I sense a lag, if, if you have stopped, if you have sort of let down that commitment to me, like I'm going to swipe, you know, I, I'm going to move on to the next bid yeah. for my attention. It's yeah. very interesting, actually, because it's almost um, really good short form content does does the job so well. But interestingly, then other attempts at it where it doesn't quite work, you, they, they stand out very, very easy, like a sore thumb. And actually, just picking up on what you were saying there, Catherine, I, I, I agree completely. I, I, I don't think you can necessarily take if you've written a feature film or if you've written a script for a 30 second, uh, sorry, 30 minute TV show and just cut it up and dice it, dice it up and make it into short form content. I, I think while we've seen the rise of short form um, over the last sort of, um, let's say year, year or two specifically, we've also seen a significant rise in long form. So we're in this second golden age of television where, you know, um, this plethora of new, new 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 sort of platforms are emerging with some of the daily basis at the moment and uh we've got we've got an incredible wealth of content that we're being offered both in terms of long form and short form and what that kind of says to me is that we're we're doing a good job of appealing to consumers at different points in their day with diff different different types of consumers we're bringing people in that wouldn't otherwise perhaps watch content on those platforms so i i, I would i would probably 
exercise a bit of caution with taking something that's been already written for perhaps a, 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 a format, whether it be a feature film or a, a 30 minute TV show, but just think about short forms as a, as a, as a different canvas to, to work on. Yeah, it's almost like you can't, like it's just almost like two different things. Like if it's already been it's in the video format, like that one just by chopping it up doesn't necessarily make it better or easier for short form. Like it's easier no. if you are like, if you already have a script or, you know, written, like I'm seeing very often when I'm talking to a lot of independent filmmakers, they're like, oh my gosh, should I convert my script now into a TV show or a web series? You know, and there it just takes a little different of thinking, but yes, you can take the entire concept, but you have to kind of rewrite it now, you know, and you should actually in this time and day and age, you know, start thinking about how can you adapt your project into these different formats because you might have more opportunities and get the pick up there you know but if it's already cut like as Catherine and and dan are saying it's like if it's already cut you can't just take like for example in the marketing world you can't just take a two minute trailer and saying hey i'm just going to chop it up and make you know a six second version of it to be on instagram right you know mm -hmm. it's like you actually have trailer houses who will actually then create specific pieces that feel like a trailer you know but it's but it's not like just chopping the trailer into pieces it's it's different exactly. It doesn't, you don't always have this ability, depending obviously on the project, but hopefully you're able to build what you're building specifically for the platform you're building it on. And then considering all the best practices that sort of get involved in it. I actually saw in the chat too, I think Andrew said text on short form or content versus no text. It's like, you have to think about that. If someone's watching with or without sound, um, do you provide context uh, uh, with some text and then get them to turn on sound? Or if they're already watching on sound, how do you still get, get them to visually engage? And also across all short form platforms, I think text is a really unique way where you could be listening to the audio of someone saying, something and then the text could be completely in contrast with whatever they're saying which is its own little device so it's like there's so many different ways so if you can build specifically for the platform you're on um it, it helps make sure people will see it in, in a very algorithm algorithmic uh, uh, uh ecosystem yeah no that I, I actually noticed the same comment and i was thinking the exact same thing and, and even though tiktok is always sound on uh, I think text on screen still does a lot for you, whether mm -hmm. it's sort of providing that like meta layer of commentary and sort of functioning in that way, or if it's just driving engagement by giving people something to read while they listen to it as well. I think text on screen mm -hmm. is a really important part of short form for um, in most cases. All right, you guys, I'm pulling up a couple slides. We've been discussing some of this already, but okay, let's jump into a bit, a little bit more algorithmic, just algorithmic, everybody say that three times fast. <laughs> <laughs> algorithmic distribution powers, content discovery, tell me more about how TikTok works, and then we're jumping a bit on Instagram as well. See, I love it. We've got the slides ready to go, but our, our uh, listeners, our attendees are already asking the questions, so good job us figuring it out. Tell me more about TikTok. Um, sure, happy to. Um, I recognize that TikTok is sort of the new kid on the block for uh, many of us, and especially those of us who might be over 30, God forbid. Um, so, uh, or 25, gosh, if I'm being honest. But, um, so I, I thought, you know, maybe just a, a quick kind of what is TikTok might be in order. Um, you know, we're an app. We are um, all about short form vertical video. Um, as soon as you open it, you're in the feed and that is the algorithmic content distribution. Um, so that means that the more time you spend watching TikToks, like in your For You feed, kind of swiping past videos you don't like, liking the ones that you do, watching more than once, et cetera, th those are all cues that the algorithm takes to determine what's the next video that you are served. Um, and so that means you don't have to search anything. You don't really have to make any choices. If you don't want to, you can truly just enjoy an endless stream of videos that gets more and more attuned to your taste as you go. Um, so that means that, you know, what, if you're trying to get seen in For You, if you want your content to reach a broad audience, you've really got to think about things like just kind of quality signals to the algorithm, grabbing and holding attention, two to three seconds maybe up front, um, you know, do I hold the attention of my audience throughout the duration of this video? Those are the factors that really um, impact performance. And by performance, I mean essentially that the more people watch your video and interact with it, the more the algorithm will show it to other people. That's really what drives that, that content discovery in for you on TikTok. Um, and I think also just the nature of the product, if you haven't used it yourself, um, 
you might not know, just it, it's kind of inherently very interactive. A big thing that, that users do on TikTok is click on the sound of the video that they're watching, and then that pulls up the camera and essentially you create to that sound. So that's where you see lots of lip sync videos, um, you know, sort of lip syncing along to dialogue from TV and film is, is, is like pretty popular on TikTok as well. And when your video has, you know, great sound, a great audio track that can really help um, drive more views because that's an element of interactivity. And if users are interacting with your video, that's a signal to the algorithm that it's a high quality video. Um, and then because videos automatically loop, um, that you know obviously can mean that your video gets watched more than once by any given person. Um, and that is often, a, I think users will re-watch videos because when they're trying to sort of make sure they, they caught everything that happened and did, you know, did I get the joke entirely or did, am I trying to learn the dance move? You know, those are sort of factors that come into play for um, driving high views because of loops. Um, and I think the opportunity on TikTok, I mean, it, it, we don't have the sort of set up shop and turn on ad credits like YouTube. Um, where, you know, there's uh, a sort of an approximation of a television channel that's all about you, essentially, is sort of the, t the YouTube opportunity, the way I think about it. Um, but I think the, the, f the real opportunity on TikTok is driven by the fact that you don't need to have a big audience. You can, your first video can get millions of views because the algorithm has served it to millions of people because it was a great video. Um, so you could have 10 followers and millions of views uh, and those millions of views can translate into big opportunities, you know, within TikTok, outside TikTok. On that slide, I had a couple examples that you may have noticed um, on other platforms as well. Uh, there's sort of been breakout TikTok quarantine stars um, that, that I would consider kind of in, in the writer category as well. You've got Bowman Martinez Reed, who does these amazing um, sort of reality uh, uh, parody videos that you're just indistinguishable from a scene from Real Housewives or um, really it, the, 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 the key touchstone is obviously Real Housewives but um, you know he's just he's this very funny guy from Canada um, who's just making really funny videos in his kitchen essentially um, and then Sarah Cooper who, if you haven't seen her on TikTok, you probably have seen her on Twitter. Um, what you got for me is her TikTok handle. Um, and she has just taken the, the TikTok format of lip syncing to iconic audio. And, um, and, and she it does an incredible impersonation of the president. Um, and I think those are just two examples of, of kind of the uh, tremendous talent and, and for sure star power, but also kind of meeting the format of TikTok as, as that sort of um, perfect synergy of format and creative instincts. And, um, and they've both, you know, got representation now, obviously, and, and are sort of going to have pretty big careers, I think. Thank you. Okay, whoop, whoop, I jumped ahead because we're running around. So TikTok, okay, seriously, I promise you it's coming back. Instagram, Jeffrey, tell me more about Instagram TV. Instagram. Hello. Hi. Also, so can we acknowledge like also this is my living room, just like 260, whatever. It's like kind of hilarious. I also have a newborn. So I have a, my wife and I just had our first child. So you might hear some like child screaming in the other room. They just got back from a walk. So just the quarantine life. Um, so Instagram. So uh, our mission really is to connect uh, you with the people and things that you love. Um, and you can do that across. I know we're sp specifically talking about IGTV, but IGTV is a place uh, where you can upload um, uh, any kind of video content um, over a minute long, up to 60 minutes. Um, uh, vertical and horizontal content uh, is great. Uh, it's naturally sort of synced in with the ecosystem of Instagram. Um, but usually when we talk about Instagram, we talk about all the surfaces. I kind of hit those at the top, but there's feed, there's, which is feed, um, photos and videos up to 60 seconds. There's stories that short um, uh, vertical uh, 15 second bites up in that little tray. Um, best practices for that is really to tell that story, that sort of story arc that seems to kind of be the driving thing for all these uh, surfaces, just for storytelling. Um, IGTV, obviously there's live, um, which was really blown up um, over um, uh, uh, quarantine and then pandemic as, as people wanna really get that one-to-one -one connection with people or have group conversations. D-Nice is a perfect example of somebody just live streaming sort of uh, fun DJ sets and um, 
just overall chats and conversations with people. Um, and then IGTV, like we're saying, branded content, um, the other ways of surfaces of being able to uh, monetize it are coming. We're testing a bunch of, uh, of things there. Um, and really when you think in, in view Instagram, it's, it's, it's really about building a community. Yes, there are over a billion people, but how do you get that billion people to discover your content? And it's finding the communities that your content really resonates with. Um, and there are just sort of pods of, of communities that have really grown. So if it's it, not the best example, but if your content is around flowers, there's definitely a flower community out there that is looking for your content. So they can discover that through hashtags um, as well as um, other discoverable surfaces. We obviously have Explore. So another great um, uh, way to get your content discovered um, and a way to discover content is engaging with content there and you'll get surfaced there. Another strategy people have used uh, are creating um, accounts that are, are really tailored to an interest and then being able to dive deeper into that interest and discover things and just being able to uh, speak to people in that um, uh, community is a, is a, um, uh, a benefit of, of those uh, surfaces. Um, so that's um, Jeffrey, can you also talk a little bit about like the importance of very often you hear people doing collaborations, right? You know, particularly, you know, it's like taking their content and merging. It's almost like merging content with other content, right? Because it seems like there's quite a bit there that I see, you know, particularly on Instagram and, and similar platforms. Yeah, I think a, a lot of creators have done that in a, a really great way. It's they both have either I've identified that they have a great idea, a great audience. There's crossover between um, what they love doing. So if there are two film industry experts who want to talk about something, they will um, uh, combine together, they'll push to each other and support each other through tags and at mentions um, in an IGTV piece or stories content. Um, and so that's, it's a great way to build on each other's audiences to create that sort of one-to-one uh, uh, um, -one conversation with people on, on Instagram. Yeah, because I know some people are asking about how do you grow it organically, and it's usually it's hard, you know, it's harder to do it that way. But there's ways. The collaborations is one way to actually do it, rather than just doing, let's say, a media spend or or publicity. Yeah, the collaboration and just identifying the the communities that through those hashtags and the, those surfaces, um, and then uh, collaborating uh, off of those. Okay, and we talked a little bit already uh, previously about short form short form versus long form. So that was part of the reason I pulled the slide down so we could see your handsome face. Tell us more about this. Uh, but you know, we know about that. Start with your headline, have the bumper, grab your attention the first three seconds. Um, I know a couple people were asking, how do I directly monetize all of this short form content, Instagram and TikTok, et cetera? Or is it more like, hey man, you grew your audience. Now, you know, Nike is coming to you. I've stumped you all with my question, huh? I think I'm, I'm happy to quickly hit it. Um, so monetization obviously is, is it's one of the things that uh, means a lot to us is being able to let people turn their passion into a living. Uh, and so we try to offer many different avenues that um, allow you to do that. Um, we're definitely testing uh, uh, rev share and IG, uh, ads on IGTV that allow um, uh, creators to make money off of, of their content that's on that surface. Um, also allowing people to um, create personal fundraisers for themselves or the things they care about. Um, and then uh, obviously providing branded content tools is another big uh, uh, function for people to be able to be discovered there um, as well as uh, um, let people know that that exists and then gives that tool for whoever you're being sponsored by to amplify that message or, or stay close to it. Yeah, it's a somewhat similar framework on TikTok, um, wherein there are branded content tools where you can be discovered by brands and, and book brand deals. Um, and we've also recently announced a, so far, fairly vaguely described uh, creator fund that will be directly compensating creators who are um, driving big views on the platform. Um, I think, honestly, and I think my suspicion is this might be most relevant for the folks uh, on this seminar. Um, I, I almost every day I'm asked by some publisher or brand if I know an editor or someone who can help them think about how they should be on TikTok. Um, obviously, a great way to uh, build a resume for that is to you know have a big TikTok account yourself and be able to point to lots of videos that you've made that um, you know show how your creative sensibility can be adapted for brands. But I think. You know, whether it's in the context of a creative agency or just, you know, your own sort of shingle, I think um, being savvy and skilled at short form um, video and, and storytelling. Um, and I think there's a lot of gray area between, you know, 
if you don't want to be an ad creative at an ad agency who's making ads, I think there's a lot of room to be a great storyteller who can work with brands and publishers who want to pay for your creative talent to help them translate to short form video for sure. We, we do exactly that actually, Catherine. Um, so there's a couple of great content creators that I've worked with over the last couple of years. Um, there's one in particular who's based down in Singapore and she creates these incredible uh, sort of flip book, stop motion animation pieces of content. And at the time it was a skill that we didn't have in house. Uh, we, we've got a, a great creative team, but that she, she definitely brought something else to the table. And we now regularly work with her as a content collaborator. We've, uh, we've introduced her to a number of the brands that we represent as an agency and she's created some incredible pieces, um, particularly for kind of franchise movies, telling the story of perhaps what happened in the last series or the last, the last movie in like 10 or 15 seconds using a flipbook animation style. But yeah, we regularly work with content creators that, that we will put in front of brands. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for people, I think, if they've got ideas to come and talk to agencies about it. Okay, you guys, I'm jumping in here. All right, we got it. We got like 15 minutes and I'm looking at all this wonderful info we still need to tell people about. All right, what's on Quibi? Yeah, the reason we added just this one is, you know, people have asked, obviously, there's a lot of interest in TikTok and Instagram. People have also asked Quibi. So we just wanted to just give like a 10 second blurb on this for when, when you're looking at Quibi, and this is some, some of this data has been um, calculated from different, different various um, separate research. When you look at, if you're trying to create content for Quibi, they're showing that, you know, four of their five ones, basically you, they're based on reality shows, right? So they have enough stars or they have celebrities on it and they list out celebrities here. Um, when they're talking about the type of genre that sticks out quite a bit, it's um, comedies. If you're trying to figure out like what type of characters you're gonna create for, um, on Quibi, they're saying it's, it's interesting when Quibi is actually pretty much equal male and female. It does skew 30 plus, around 62% of it is 30 plus, And then the next big, group of around like 30, 30 plus is around that 18 to 29 year old range. Um, the type of shows that are being, that are very successful there, if you're doing scripted, it's more drama, which ven vengeance and rage and fear, you know, kind of more of those. But if you're doing unscripted, people really want more of like these lighthearted topics. So it's just something to consider that when you're trying to create content or write content, you know, as, as Catherine and Jeffrey and Dan have said in the past, it's like, just know, who your audience is, which means on the platform, what, what is the platform accepting, you know, and when you're starting to think of those type of ideas, you know, make sure it fits with what they're trying to do. But anyway, this is just a quick overview on Quibi. Okay, Dan, like a studios on TikTok. Great, yeah, so, um... We have been fortunate enough as an agency to partner with uh, Leica Studios, the, the stop motion uh, animation studio based up in Portland. Uh, we've worked with them for over four and a half years um, across uh, multiple different movies. Uh, we actually, we helped Leica to launch originally on, on social platforms on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube uh, many years ago. Um, but we recently extended Leica's social footprint into the world of, of, of TikTok um, and it really has been a phenomenal success. Um, so brand that me and my team are very, very close to. As I say, we've worked with them for a very, very long time, but we've done something very, very different on TikTok with Leica compared to the other social platforms that we work on. And that is effectively um, giving a bit of a blank canvas to these incredibly skilled uh, stop motion animators that work out of the studio in Portland to, tr to play with new things um, and to try new types of animation. So um, the content that we've been working with Leica to, to develop and, and recommend um, is quite unique uh, in terms of um, where, where people can find it. So what we've been doing for TikTok is, as I say, different to other platforms. But um, we've, uh, we, we launched this channel, I think it was about three months ago now, uh, in partnership with Leica. Um, all of the content is created by the studio. I should be clear about that. That's, it's not content that's created by us as an agency. We're working with Leica strategically on this uh, on, on this venture but they've grown to over two million followers in, in under three months all of which has been done um, organically um, we've come, we're obviously very very proud of that their videos have been viewed on the platform more than 170 million times but part of the success I think is down to things that, that, that Catherine was talking about earlier on which is you've got this incredible canvas on TikTok um, you know Catherine said you can launch your first video and get a million views and you can do that by making sure you understand how the platform works, what the trends are, um, what the opportunities are, you know, how to capitalize on those trends and create content that's sort of working for what people are doing on that day or on that week. So we, we've, we've made a lot of recommendations to the animators up at Leica to play with certain different types of hashtags and things. And as a result of that, I think we've been able to grow the platform really, 
really, really quickly. But um, it's been it's been a great success, and it's it's definitely additive to things that we're doing on other social platforms. We're definitely bringing a new audience in, um, and there is some great short form content on there. So please, uh, yeah, if you get a chance, go and check out Leica Studios on TikTok. All right, flipping through, uh, what do we want to be talking about with Brat TV? Yeah, we got one, like seven minutes. Yeah, this one was just more just to, as another resource, you know, for those who are watching this, is that you're hearing about a lot of social platforms. There's also production companies out there that create content specifically for audiences like Gen Z, and Brad TV is definitely on the Gen Z side. Um, for those who, have, who are familiar with it, you know, they actually create short form content in that 12 minute range. And the interesting thing too is, is that they originally did this on YouTube, but if you look at the bottom, they've actually expanded out, you know, into Instagram and Twitter and wider, you know. So, you know, you'll see these are all original pieces, all original tar targeting Gen Z. You know, there's, there's all these other companies that exist out there that you can actually look to for inspiration or to look for who want to pick up content, you know, but just check them out and you'll get, get a, a really good understanding of it. But I've, I've seen and worked with them in the past and they're good. All right. Okay. How do we pitch to everybody? What makes us super special and you want to have our stuff? Tell me more. Nobody knows how to pitch to anybody here. This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> how do you pitch? Uh, I, I'm trying to see, sorry, my, my screen is, what the, so it says, how do you pitch to Lost yeah, since a lot of us here are some form of content creator, hey, we've got stuff, we want to get it on there, we know it's perfect, and, you know, we are going to be number one, but how do we get it to you? How do we pitch it? Is it the same as a long-form pitch? What what do we need to have ready? I think the same, I think we talked before about the, the kind of the principles of storytelling and uh, and therefore the principles of pitching apply here as well. I think if you, you know, if, you, if you've got a strong idea, it's around creating a treatment and, uh, and, and, and probably showing in the world of short form how the idea can be adapted to um, the types of platforms that we're talking about, whether it be uh, Quibi, Facebook Watch, TikTok, uh, Instagram Live. Um, I think understanding, again, back to what we talked about before, the canvas of those different, the different platforms, you know, why would you pitch an idea that you think works on TikTok versus Instagram TV versus Facebook Watch? You know, it's, it's worth creators thinking about the unique um, attributes and opportunities that each of those platforms offers but you know I think that the, the rules are still the same it's kind of you've got to have a good strong pitch and uh, be able to present the idea in a, in, a, in a very direct manner very quickly. And Jeffrey and Catherine uh, you know and this is I like to combine slides when possible so what makes a pitch really stand out in a good way what are some oh dear I know you didn't you know all that kind of stuff best and worst thumbs up thumbs down. For, for pitching, I would say any kind of short form, it's like always thinking about, and I made this point earlier, but I want to harp it. Like it, it, it's important to have a strategy on how it would be distributed or um, uh, continually engaged with um, on the platform you're distributing it on. So it gets from like creation to programming, but does it go out all at once in a binge um, uh, format? Does it go out uh, every single week and then using for Instagram specifically using the surfaces to let your audience know when new episodes coming uh, uh, content between the episodes that people can engage with, get people interacting um, uh, and also uh, a building base, uh, a, a social um, Bible for whatever project you're putting together uh, it is, is, is something that everyone should sort of think about. Um, I think, uh, you know, that's exactly right. It's really about knowing the tools that you have and that the, the audience and their expectations on the canvas or the platform where you're going to be. Um, uh, you know, there isn't really a direct way to pitch TikTok right now. Um, you know, it's an open platform. Welcome, launch an account. Um, that, that's kind of how to pitch yourself. We have um, a, a couple of different programs essentially that um, that that where we work directly with creators who um, who are sort of innovating, you know, not necessarily the biggest creators in terms of views uh, or followers, but, you know, um, people that have a unique voice and sort of bring something interesting and diverse and unexpected to our platform. That's, that's often the, the lens that we think um, through. I, I just want to reiterate, though, sort of what I was saying earlier, because I really do think this is what TikTok represents for creative individuals right now. I mean, 
the being new, so many people, so many of the gatekeepers, so many of the people with checks to write do not know how to do TikTok well. Um, do not know like what really hits are, you know, aren't as comfortable with the tone or the pacing or the format. Um, and, and in this sort of new era of, of sort of TikTok's uh, fast growth and um, especially with just how influential I think um, a lot of our audiences and the perception of influence happening on TikTok means that if you are a savvy creator yourself, if you've got a point of view and a voice that you want to translate to short form video, being good at TikTok is going to open doors, um, you know, obviously, and in, in marketing yourself and using all of the other platforms as well to, you know, um, share your TikTok expertise uh, and, and amplify what you're doing on TikTok. I think actually cross-platform, thinking cross-platform is always super important. Um, but I, I do think that's where the, uh, the biggest opportunity for, for the folks on this call probably is. Um, well, not the only opportunity, obviously, but I think it is a big opportunity to kind of be an early leader and, um, and really establish yourself as, um, uh, as someone with a savvy that is in short supply and high demand. All right, and one thing I find interesting, thank you, uh, it doesn't seem to matter you know, if you're doing short form, long form, medium form. Uh, but, you know, as Jeffrey was really pointing out, you also need to know not only how to create the story, but as you're saying, hey, I need to know how to present that and market it and show that I've really been thinking it through. So alas, it's, uh, you have to have a more 270 degree view, not just being the content creator, but also know how to do some marketing, how to do some distributing, have your, your whole package in order. You can't just be doing one part of it. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> like you have to like know all of the, you know, it just helps. It helps when you go in there thinking through that strategy of like from the onus we've, you know, we're putting that strategy together. Yeah. To me, it's, it's like traveling in, into a foreign country. Do you have to be fluent in the language? No, but you should be able to speak a few words of whichever language you're talking to, marketing language, distributing language, add language, whatever it is, so that you can have a conversation with these amazing people here who are experts in their fields. And they're going to say, okay, she, he is trying and I'll, I'll give them a go. I'll help them out because we've made the effort to, to, you know, learn your language as well. Exactly. I always know the, the words, where is the bathroom when I travel? So I make sure <laughs> that. <laughs> No, it's true. No, I think, I mean, it is, I mean, you have, it's ideally, you know, the content is always the most important, but what's really important too is knowing how to market it. What are those angles? Like as, as everyone talks about, you understand who you're pitching to, who's the platform, who's the audience that will make you a lot more successful. Because if you're, you know, if you're, you're making an audience to, to, let's say we talk about like TV and with your Gen Z, but you, you're targeting older audiences it's, it's a miss, right? So you can have the best content, but you have to kind of understand who you're going after and understanding the nuances of the, the importance of, you know, I know Jeffrey, you were talking about, you know, very often there's organic, you know, organic ways to get people to follow you. There's collaborations, but there's also the importance of, there's also the marketing, the media, the publicity portions of it, you know, that will get out there. That's that you have to kind of take into account in all of it. And either sometimes you have to take it on your own or you find out hopefully depending on the platforms or the production companies, they should be able to help out too. Okay, the big thing, DIY. What can we be do? Whoop, you gotta do that too. Take our survey in a yes. moment, y'all. Yes. All right, <laughs> DIY, what can we do while we're you know, at home? Be creative, be productive, let's move forward with it. What can we do, everybody? Okay, the reason I, the first one is so important. Start create original content, please people, because we, as a world are burning through so much content right now because we're all stuck at home in quarantine. I mean, literally there are so many, seriously, broadcasters and companies that are looking for good content. I mean, an extreme example is like the other week, I, I burned through so much content watching it. I'm, I started watching how a documentary on the Boeing 777, but not just the Boeing 777, how they clean the Boeing 777. I mean, that's how desperate I am to find good content, you know, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> really you know? interesting, Michael. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's like, I will send you the link, okay, guys? <laughs> and, and me, please. And me, that sounds fascinating. <laughs> a 
love it, right? So go out there and create it, you know, and we've talked earlier about how important of, you know, you can adapt it, you know, just be mindful. You just can't cut down an AV piece into a short form. You know, it does take scripting and editing, you know, to kind of adapt it properly. You can spend, you can spend it there. You know, I think the first one is more for the writers who haven't created anything, create original. If you already have current projects, you can work on that. And then as we've all talked about too, is it's really just know your audience, you know, know who you're going to be pitching to and how you're going to create the content. Everyone has different length, length versions, the audiences that they're targeting, the type of content that they're buying, but keep that in mind. So there's a lot you can be doing now while you're stuck at home in your pajamas, you know, and waking up every day. And what was, um, wait, who had the, uh, Dustin had the term, what was the term? Um, oh, blur's day. Blur's day. Today's blur's day. It all blurs in together, right? What day is it? It's blur's day. So. Yep. <laughs> so excellent. All right. Any other thoughts on that? Or can I tell people to go fill in our survey so that they can win final draft? Sounds good. Go on, Jen. <laughs> yes, I've learned how to flip it one slide at a time. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We are about to say goodbye, but before we do, please take our survey. Um, Michael, you have the link handy, yes? I'll just put it into the chat right there. Big few on my end here. Um, so we are excited. Our wonderful sponsor, Final Draft, is giving us two full downloads of uh, you know their latest software and two mobile apps. Uh, but you got to fill in the survey in order to qualify for it. If you filled in the survey from the previous panel, fill it in again. Yes, please. The more data we can gather, the better for us. Because, you know, we want to get some sponsors like Leica and Nike and TikTok and Instagram and all these wonderful places. Um, so we need that data. So, and you know, again, if you've already filled it in, Tell us what new you learned, what more you like about us going uh, virtual. All right, so that, uh, Michael, that is in the chat box now, yeah? Yep. Yay! Okay, everybody, so that is live and ready to go. Follow us on socials. So we're, of course, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, if you are here today, you will get on our email list unless you tell me otherwise. My email is right down there, uh, jennifer at beautifuldayproductions.us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm leaving that up for just an extra moment. And then if you haven't written it down already, well, that's up to you. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have made this the best afternoon of my month. Uh, so, and thank you to our sponsors. Yay, Dustin Enid and the Writers Gallup Foundation. Thank Round you. of applause. We've just said thank you, Final Draft, for these wonderful giveaways. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our plug for ourselves. You too can become a sponsor or let us know who you know that wants to sponsor. We have, I'm delighted to say, over 1,200 people on our email list right now. Woo! And we're still growing. Uh, we need help with some, you know, sponsors for website and logo design, audio tech, eventually for venue, because, you know, we look forward to being back in person at some point soon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is myself. That's Dan Heal, Michael Fisk, Jeffrey Weisenbaugh, and Catherine Hallaby. Thank you for making my day, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. For Thanks, thank Jennifer. you. Yeah, thank yes. you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, thanks guys.